What I found in my life is that the, it's not the random thing that I go somewhere far away to do. It's an idea that's adjacent to one that's already working on. And I think that idea of Jesus saying like, love your neighbor, love the person that's adjacent to you. Yeah. Like somebody that you share a border with, just love that person. And it does sounds noble to go across an ocean but it sounds scriptural to go across the street. Yeah. And so to do that, and then what you find the neatest things when you look at what's adjacent, all of a sudden you make new friends. <laughs> hey, Mr. <Ed. laughs> We're in the search of finding good, and here I am speaking to a former lawyer. I mean, good and lawyer. Do they even go yeah. together in that way? <laughs> Are there any good lawyers? <laughs> yeah, I decided to go straight maybe 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, and uh, being a lawyer is honorable, and bagging groceries is too, and uh, the things that uh, we're able to do to provide for our families is great. But I hope that we'll find a deeper purpose in everything that we do, and that will take us sometimes from job to job to job. So yeah. you're not limited just by your capabilities. Like yeah. You might be capable of being a lawyer. I've got a couple of pieces of paper that say I could do it in some states, but, but that doesn't mean I'm a lawyer. I know how to spell words. It doesn't mean I'm an author. <laughs> I, I, I know how to get on a horse that doesn't make me a cowboy. <laughs> we're not the sum of everything we know how to do. Yeah. We're, we're who Jesus says we are. Mm -hmm. And he calls us beloved, which is just crazy. Did you know at the turn of the century, the most common name, it was eighth most popular name on earth was Bertha. Now, if your name is Bertha, that is just terrific. Um, but Jesus calls us beloved. He says, like, that is the name I think about when I think about you and me and our mess ups. And, and the trick is for us to start thinking of others as beloved by God, mm -hmm. uh, even people that are difficult. Now, it's easy to think of, like, all the nice people that come to mind and say, like, well, they're beloved. They make us feel great. But what about somebody that makes us feel uncomfortable? Mm -hmm. What's, what about somebody that's kind of in your grill? Uh, about things, can they still be beloved by God? And I think the answer is yes, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. so I just don't want to be the person that's renaming something, someone that God has created and giving them a new different name, like, uh, you know, sourpuss, jerk, <laughs> I just, all the names that spring to mind. I just go like, God's up to different stuff in yeah. your life right now. Well, take a minute, maybe speak to all the guys and girls out there in corporate America. You know, you were in that law firm how do you do good? Do you, have you got to leave corporate America to do good? Or can you do good in the, as some people call it, the rat race cat? How can we do good in that world under all the pressures? Yeah, finding your purpose in what you do. So a bigger purpose than, let's say, something noble like providing for your family. But there's actually something bigger than that. Uh, providing for your family's not just financial needs, but their emotional needs. Mm -hmm. And that might mean you have to tap the brakes mm -hmm. on some of the things that you're doing. But let's say you have a corporate job that uh, you're able to generate a lot of income. What about thinking that is a tool for fundraising mm. so that you can then do amazing things with your family for the benefit of others. I mean, that's the legacy we were talking about you're gonna leave behind. Yeah. So to say, who is it that has a need and could we go as a family and, and then teach the people that we love, our children, spouses, whoever it's that you love, that the way we roll is that we see a need, we meet a need. Yeah. And we don't make a big deal about it. Yeah. We don't have to get matching t-shirts because we met a need. Just be like, just go meet the need. That's and I love that. Yeah. So you meant, actually mentioned family there. Uh, what, what about people that find themselves, you know, they, they, they love Christ. They've got these remarkable intentions. They're living with a family that don't have that same belief system. And they're almost resistant to the good they want to do to them. How can you encourage them, Bob, to 
keep going. Oh my gosh, this feels like you've been reading my playbook. My family, uh, faith wasn't a big deal. And you know what? I've just, uh, I, I just see that God is doing different things in my life than in theirs. And uh, sweet Maria loves God, our kids love God, but it, that's about the circle. Like we are gen one of a family of faith. Um, and so that doesn't make me feel like a victim. It makes me feel like a participant with endless opportunities. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that'll come with that is that you're constantly gonna be misunderstood. Yeah. I mean, I have family members that hear the stuff that I do. Oh, I have family members that don't know I own this. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't told them to let the cat out of the bag because they just wouldn't understand. Like you're making a place for people to come and get better and, uh, or you're doing this thing in another country for people that mm -hmm. we don't get. And rather than just go have that awkward conversation, like I've just decided I'm comfortable in not being fully understood. I want to be understood by Jesus. Like that's the person that I want to have know me. But to have, I want Sweet Maria Goff to know me. Uh, but if a, a person that I work with, a colleague, a neighbor, somebody that uh, might call me over the phone and, and say, uh, I think this about that, I'm like, I'm, I just think that's terrific. <laughs> that's awesome. I don't want to hear people that have opinions. I want people to tell me your experience. So I get mm. asked all the time as a lawyer, like, what, what is your advice for me to do with respect to whatever? And I never give advice. I just say, this is my experience. Or I don't have any experience having done that because everybody's got an opinion. They're like ears. Everybody's mm -hmm. got a couple of them. But I want people that actually have some experience to say, what I experienced when I felt rejection was, what I experienced when I felt misunderstood was. And as, if we can identify at that level with people, we actually change the whole conversation. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about positions anymore. We talk about people. Yeah. We don't talk about like what side you're on. Yeah. You talk about that we're in this together. And, and this isn't putting this happy face over a bunch of really difficult conversations that need to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm glad for all of the conversations that happen, but, but what is the number one one conversation one person needs to have isn't necessarily the number one mm -hmm. conversation I need to have right now. Yeah. And I don't think less of them. I hope they don't feel less of me, but, but actually, truth be known, I actually don't care. Um, I know why it is that I'm focusing on what I'm focusing on. Yeah. We're doing things in a couple countries uh, where there's a lot of tension, there's wars, uh, they will kill you uh, for expressing your faith. And that doesn't make it more noble. That just makes that my number one right now. And if somebody else has a different number one, mm. I want to learn about their number one, but I just don't want to be told that needs to be my number one. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm picking up on that. Uh, here, I mean, here we are. My, my goodness, it's, it's like a holding center for heaven. Isn't I mean, it's this just, just like I'm just, just checked in and yes. I'm about to go. I mean, it's surreal. It's so calm. It's so peaceful. But I've been in America now for five years, and it's getting a little crazy. <laughs> I mean, and you're the guy that wrote the book Love Does and Everybody Always. And I think if America ever needed a couple of books outside of the Bible, it's that sort of, what's your take and how, how can the Christian community at this time, Bob, continue um, more than ever to really just love on this world and not join the narrative of the crowd? Yeah, I think it's to love people without an agenda. Because uh, as soon as you have an agenda, then it's a program. Mm -hmm. And we don't need another program. What we need is a body of people eyes fixed on Jesus that are releasing that kind of love into mm. a community with a load of intention. Uh, and so if we know why we're doing what we're doing, and if you have a setback uh, along the way, we got on a horse together, I had a setback, the horse bucked me off. And so you could make up a rule uh, that I'm never getting on a horse again. You could make up a rule, horses are dangerous. And indeed, horses buck. <laughs> yes, it that was one. you. <laughs> <laughs> We're not saying names, <laughs> buckaroo. Um, but one of the things that we need to do is to uh, revisit some of the stories that we've told. Uh, we've made up a story to explain something that happened, and then we made a rule to protect the story. And some of those stories just aren't true. 
uh, about people that are unsafe. You may have had an encounter with somebody that you felt like they weren't uh, like a safe person to have a conversation with. And so you made a rule, I'm never having a conversation with that person mm -hmm. again. And I actually want to revisit that rule. Mm. Oh, is it possible they're having an off day? I've had a couple, how about you? Oh yeah. Yeah. Regular. So what if we just say, I'm going to revisit some of the stories I've made and some of the rules I've made to surround the stories and see if it's really true. It's kind of like this. There's a sport, it's called spelunking. And a spelunker, or a spelunker goes down a cave as deep as they can go and they've got a light on and they turn on the light when they get to the bottom of the cave and they look around. Here's my question. What got written on your cave wall? Mm. Did someone write on your cave wall about, say, your faith? that you need to be antagonistic to people that have a different worldview? Mm -hmm. uh, did somebody write on your cave wall that you need to be the person that is the advocate or the lawyer for Jesus? Yeah. And I just want to revisit that and say, boy, I wonder if that was true then, uh, but I wonder if it's still true right now. Yeah. And, uh, and if we could re revisit some of the things that have been kind of written on our cave wall, it would be really worth it. Did you know this, the uh, eraser was invented 200 years after the pencil. Isn't that crazy? Oh. Mind blown. Yeah. yeah, so now that the eraser is here, I would just say let's erase some things that just aren't true about other people. People mm -hmm. that have different worldviews, people that engage us differently. Some people engage with just a lot of an overwhelming amount of intensity yeah. and just chill out. That doesn't make them dangerous. That makes them like really engaged. Now, I'm not saying to stick around people. You, like some of these trees will grow f better further away, mm -hmm. but I don't think I want to make up a rule that I'm mm -hmm. not going to engage anybody that's identifies with this person or with this idea or and I just don't think we're those rules have been helpful to yeah. us. Just we're we're used to seeing you on like incredible stages, conferences, our church, and you're up there and you're in the zone. You look you look fully alive. And yet I see you here. Here we are. There's no thousands of people. There's no crowds. There's no claps. Or, and you still feel fully alive. For yeah. you, where are you most fully alive? Is it with the crowds or is it at a place like this? What do we bob goff the person? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I'd rather go a mile deep with a few people than an inch deep with a thousand mm. people. Like just that idea, if you only have a brief period of time to communicate an idea, that's terrific. Go do whatever is adjacent to you. Um, but right now in this season of life where I want to be a grandpa, I want to be available, um, I'd just rather go really deep. It would be the difference. Have you ever gone uh, snorkeling? Mm -hmm. And then you're up on the top and you're looking down at all the fish and you're like, this is awesome. But I want to be a scuba diver. <laughs> like I want to go down that's and find brilliant. the treasure. Yeah. I want to find this sunken trip. I've wrecked, I <laughs> dove on a wreck before and I know there's like thousands of people have been through this thing, but I'm still thinking there's going to be like <laughs> doubloons, whatever those are. And like, I'm just going to find something. And I think the thing that's changed for me, and it wasn't a function of these recent events that have happened, but I just want to do uh, less snorkeling and more scuba mm. diving. I want to go deeper with fewer people and so yeah. to create a place where that can happen. I teach at Pepperdine Law School but I also teach at San Quentin. <laughs> <laughs> It's awesome. There's a correlation. I'm, oh, it's crazy. <laughs> One of the things I'm learning, I don't go as a teacher, I'm the student there. I'm learning about authenticity. And these guys are in the prison yard and they're like, they've got weights and they're pumping iron and all that. And so we got together in a group. We broke it down to a group of about 10 people. And, and I, we were going around. And we, the first thing we did is say, how much time does each guy have unexpired like on their sentence? Here was the average, including me, 107 years. So they they had had some wow. setbacks in their life. And I said, you know, if I was pumping iron, you know, the thing I need to get off my chest would be the bar. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> and he said, let's just go around uh, the circle here and say, what do you need to get off your chest? Mm. And each guy then talked about something he needed to get off their chest, uh, a desire for uh, a reconciliation with a, a spouse, an apology to somebody. Uh, we went around the circle and we got to the guy right next to me and I asked him like, what do you need to get off your chest? And he said, I've been in San Quentin for 20 years and I've been telling people I didn't do it. And he took a deep breath and he said, I did it. And I'm telling you, in that moment, Andrew, he was the freest wow. guy I've ever met. He just got real with what happened. He just, like, he, until we reconcile what really happened, if we can just go back to the eight-year-old version of ourselves where we got wounded or hurt, mm. go to the scene of the crime, and if we can see it, then we can understand it then we can ask Jesus to help us fix it. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of us have just like said like, I don't wanna deal with that stuff back there. And, and I think one of the things that we can do is help people to go back there, to just grab a hand and just say, let's go back there together. Let's just like look at that together. And a setback isn't a campsite. We don't mm -hmm. need to make that the place that we stay, but mm -hmm. I wanna see it so I can understand it. And this verse about making our requests known to God, to a mm -hmm. God that says, I already know it before you pray it. Mm -hmm. I think it's making a request known to ourselves. We need to see it mm -hmm. so we can understand it. So we can say, Jesus, I need help fixing this. I got to get this thing off my chest. I'm not going to be telling everybody I didn't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, these guys have been another example. Because I showed up, I got within their blast radius. They became the most powerful teachers to me. Bob, you seem to go to the most extreme communities to try and do that. I mean, nations like Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria. What makes you run into a place that everyone's running out of? Well, it's not like a, a, the, a, this concept of like a, you know, heroic, this or that, but to just go where the needs are. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some uh, immense needs in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. I hope we're running in that direction. It's San Quentin, mm -hmm. down the street, forget ends of the earth, go to the end of your street. Yeah. But when I do hear about something that's gone terribly wrong for somebody, then I want to take action. That's my like resting position. Well, like, is there something we can do? There was a group of people that Al Qaeda decided that they were going to starve to death. So they made a ring around them seven miles in diameter and wouldn't let any food in. And that, that just chapped me when I heard about it. Do you know you can rent a cargo plane? <laughs> <laughs> I've never Googled that. We got one in Italy and we filled it with food for 60,000 people in Nairobi and we flew it over the heads of these guys and landed on the sand. Like one of the things that would be really beautiful if you lose all that overseas stuff and to say, what about making a pie for your neighbor? What about washing their car? What about doing something really tangible right where you are? Mm. And then maybe you can expand your influence to other places, but I just think that's the most heroic work we can do, just right in our neighborhoods with crusty old neighbor number four. <laughs> Nobody wants to talk to because they're, they're grousing about your dog or your parking job or whatever, and just go like, this is an opportunity for me to experience selfless love. Well, to so just say, good. I'm not making them a project. I'm a student, I'm not a yeah. teacher here. And, uh, and so what will happen then is that that will then lead to other opportunities. Uh, we do have a place in Afghanistan. The Taliban has taken over most of the country now and they won't let little girls learn how to read and write. And I just like, I, I, I don't want to proselytize anybody. I think Jesus leads people to Jesus. Mm -hmm. I don't think we do. Um, but I want them to learn enough that they can make a decision. So they need to be literate. And so, so I met a guy on WhatsApp. <laughs> As you do. He said he was from Afghanistan. I'm like, awesome. I'm looking for somebody from Afghanistan. And I'm trying to like find out what he does. So like, how do you spend your day? <laughs> he wouldn't say anything. So I'm like, what the heck? So uh, I went to Washington, D.C. and I asked around. I'm like, have you heard of this guy? And here's the word I got. He's a good guy. <laughs> I like got any more detail, nothing. So it was about two years ago, I flew to Kabul, Afghanistan to meet this guy. And when I get off the airplane, I, I get a text message from him. And he said, Bob, I can't meet you at the airport. <laughs> I'm like, oh, shoot. <laughs> Actually, I don't think I said shoot. <laughs> he said, what you need to do is leave the airport and start walking through Kabul. 
and I do not blend. Uh, he said, you're gonna come to a car and the last number on the license plate is seven, get in the car. And so I'm like, we all have that decision to make. I mean, mm. are you gonna start walking or are you gonna get back on the plane? And I just think what we can do as a community is to do the next courageous thing. When we bought this camp, somebody bought me a, uh, a movie, it's called We Bought a Zoo. Have you seen that movie? No. Oh, you gotta get okay. it on Netflix or something. But it's a single dad trying to raise his son and he's explaining, they kind of like bought, the, they thought they were buying a house, it turns out there was a zoo behind it. And, and he's explaining life to his son. And he says, son, all it takes is 20 seconds of just insane courage. Mm. 20 seconds and it will change everything. And I think in Kabul, I had my 20 seconds to just say, I'm just gonna go find the car and get in it. It turns out this guy is way up in Afghanistan's leadership. What he wanted to know is if I would trust him enough to do what he told me to do, yeah. then he'd trust me enough to start a girl's school. And one of the things that I think God is asking all of us every day as we meet difficult people is will you trust me enough to do what I told you to do? And what he told us to do is to love them. And I get it, it's super hard, but I'm not trying to be right, I'm trying to be Jesus. I'm trying to summon 20 seconds of just insane courage uh, to, to just take that next step, make that phone call send the text, but don't you dare stop at the text. That's mm. too easy. Mm. Like say, show up mm. and just say, let's go do this thing, make the pie. Like there's something beautiful that happens when we express our faith and love. That's Galatians 5, 6. Mm -hmm. The only thing that matters is faith expressed in love. Jeez. And I think the way that we express our love is in kindness. Mm -hmm. It isn't a Hallmark card. It's in extraordinary kindness, courageous kindness. the last seven years uh, traveling around from city to city about we've added up about hundred and ten cities each year for the last seven years and then uh, maybe nine or ten countries so I'm just been always on the move and I remember talking to you guys and saying when I'm a grandpa I'm done. Yeah. Do you remember that? I do. I remember. I'm too. Out. I remember where we were. Yeah, we booked things nine months in a day ahead of time. Yeah. So when I found out, somebody got like, I forget sonograms and Instagrams. <laughs> <laughs> I want just a baby. <laughs> so uh, we found out the word that I was going to be a grandpa, and I thought, well, this is great. So I just got on the phone. I canceled everything that was scheduled. I said, I'm out. Uh, and so it was about that time that this came available. And so I think what we can do is to say, what do you really want? Yeah. And then ask yourself, why do you want it? Mm -hmm. And then finally decide, what are you gonna do about it? Yeah. So what do you want? Good. Why do you want it? What are you gonna do about it? That's pretty cool. And so I knew what I wanted, which is to be available. And I think that's one way that's... to honor the people around you, the ones that are adjacent to yeah. you. It's a great way to honor God, to yeah. just be available to one another. I know you're available to me. Friends at Bayside have been great sources of encouragement and uh, to be part of a larger family yeah. together, yeah. available to one another through thick and thin. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. I hope for all the people that are uh, listening that they have people that are uh, available to them. Yeah. And the crazy thing about availability is it won't cost you a nickel. It, mm. It'll cost you five minutes of time, but it won't cost you a nickel. That's brilliant. You can just say, I'm gonna be available. So if somebody says, well, I can't afford to do this, I can't afford to do this, well, like you can just answer your phone. Yeah. I'm still getting about 100 calls a day from the back of the book. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get a thing done. It's awesome. And I, I'll tell you, some of the calls are a little wonky. Of course. <laughs> but you know what? I just assume every time that God's up to different things in their life yeah. that he happens to be up to in my life. Yeah. Finally, Bob. Um, there's a million people out there and they're all just wishing that you were their grandfather because <laughs> you've loved on them for years and you're always loving us and taking every time we come around you but we just feel so much better about ourselves but what about you how can we pray for you how can people actively pray for you what's the the one two things in your heart you're going 
oh, I just need God to come through here. This is my this is my dream, your latest book, Dream Big. I need God to help me with this dream. Is there anything that you could get a ton of people to pray for? Yeah, my hope would be this, that I would have greater and greater perspective on what's going on, being situationally aware, knowing what's going on around me, deciding what I'm going to do about it. Uh, you know we're building a vineyard over there. And, uh, and uh, the first thing you uh, need to do when you're doing a vineyard is you need to clear the brush. So I got this big machine that clears the brush. Do you know what's underneath the brush? Rattlesnakes. Oh, wow. <laughs> I found a couple, but they're not as scary once you get them from out from under the brush. You, once you can see them, and the same will hold true with the relationships. Mm -hmm. Once you clear away all the distractions, well, I, uh, I cleared the brush and I was going to move the excavator to another part of the field for this vineyard that's going in. And the, uh, the excavator hit a tree and hanging from the tree is a huge beehive. And the beehive landed on the excavator. <laughs> 10,000 ticked off bees. They are going nuts. But you know what I had? A door. And I shut the door. If you want to pray for me, it would be that I would take mm. all the things that are above in the world. That, and that would be my prayer for the people that are listening. That we would not be distracted. Satan doesn't need to destroy us. He wants to distract us. And you take all the chaos going outside and you would shut the door. But you don't stay inside that. What we do is we venture out. We know why we're doing what we're doing. And then we just take the next courageous step. The last thing that you do with this brusher, it spins around really fast. And when it hits a rock, it throws a spark <laughs> <laughs> in really dry brush. That starts fires, but they're small fires. So do you know what I have with me? Fire extinguisher. If you let a small fire unattended, it's going to turn into a mm -hmm. big fire. And so my last thought for me, for the other people, that are listening, it would just be to say, just be mindful. Just put out the small fires. Mm -hmm. Like, don't let them be big fires. If you have a distraction, just put it out. Like, just shut the door to that stuff to get, uncover the things that are hiding, the things that are making you afraid. If you're afraid of connecting or going deep with people, just uncover, like, why is that? Mm -hmm. Where's that at? Ask Jesus, could you help me with that? Could you give me 20 seconds of just insane courage to overcome that and see how it turns out? Now, we decided to get on a horse. The first thing that happened to me, I ended up off the horse. And then you got a decision to make. I decided to get back on the horse. And you really did get back on that horse. Yeah. I watched it. I watched it throw you, and I watched you get back on. But around. the beautiful thing is we each got that decision to make. It's a relationship. It's a career. It's something that hurt us, someone that said an unkind word to us. And we get to decide, are we going to make a new story surrounded by a bunch of new rules and then not ride horses anymore. Mm -hmm. We just get back on the horse. And I'm so glad uh, that I did because that meant that you and I got to have a conversation. Mm. And I think that's what happens when we show up for one another and we're not just scuba diving, like you're or, or snorkeling over this stuff, but we're actually scuba diving. We're going a little deeper and saying, yeah. why are we doing what we're doing? That's where all the good stuff is. That's the place where Jesus uh, meets us. That's the place that he resides. And that's the place he wants to take us to a deeper level of understanding of ourselves and of him. Wow. Bob, uh, two things to say thank you. Number one, thank you for not dying. I mean, that was really important. <laughs> that would have been an I, awesome I mean, story, though. I, no, I couldn't have told that story. I was the guy that killed Bob Goff. That really would not have gone down well. I, I would have had death threats. I would have been moving house, all of those that things. That would have been awesome. So that was really cool. And, and, and thank you for this conversation. It oh. really has meant a lot. And I'm kind of right now, as I sit here and look out, I feel like Peter up the mountain of Transfiguration. I feel like, can we can build we just, some houses here? Just hang out. Because I don't want to go back to all the chaos, oh, but man. we're going to because um, I feel strengthened by this. So, And I hope, to your point, I hope that uh, this community of courageous people that are moving out in kindness with the love of Jesus, not having an agenda for other people, but an agenda for themselves, to express their faith and love, that they'll also find times of rest. Mm. It's times and places um, to say, it could be under a tree somewhere. Walt Disney had a dreaming tree. Isn't that crazy? It was just a, it was a tree. That's where he hatched all of his dreams. <laughs> and so find a tree to sit under and to say, God, I know you've taken me this far, but where is it that you want to go together next? Mm -hmm. What would be my next courageous move? Mm -hmm. 
Bob. I love you. Thanks, we love buddy. you. Love Thank you, too. you so much.